Have you ever been overcome with the immense feeling of nostalgia? Have you ever said to yourself, man, I miss how things were back then? Have you ever used old slang unironically? Like psych or cool beans? Did you have to look up what Chugi meant when playing Pokemon Scarlet and Violet? Well, my friends, the bad news is, is that there is no cure for getting old. So instead of ignoring the feeling, we're just gonna double down. So grab your blockbuster card, your fruit by the foot, and your favorite flavor of squeeze it. We're going to be diving into a decade of my favorite toys and or games from 1990 to 1999. Oh, and by the way, if you owned any of these things, you are required to subscribe to me and leave a comment on which thing it was. And you got a pinky swear. All right, it's a promise. Although I was just a toddler in 1990 thanks to my wonderful mother and her VHS camcorder recordings of my birthdays, I was able to see the kinds of toys I got back then. It's pretty amazing how these tapes have preserved those special moments and allowed me to reconnect with the toys of that time. One of the toddler toys captured on those tapes was the Fisher Price Little People series. They were colorful, chunky figures that sparked my imaginative play. Seeing myself playing with them brings back so many nostalgic memories. My favorite version of that series was a mechanic set where I could put a car in an elevator and wind a lever to have the car go up and down. Another toy that appeared in those cherished recordings were Duplos. They were the larger version of Lego blocks designed for younger children. I remember building towers as tall as me and then pretending to be Godzilla while knocking them down. Finally for 1990, I had two different train sets for a Brio Deluxe Railway set. That was the train set that had the magnets on the front and back that you could connect the other rail cars to. And you could put them on these wooden tracks and they would go all around everywhere. One was the standard set that you got with the Brio Deluxe Railway set. And the other was assorted Thomas the Tank Engine characters. And they were all built the exact same way with the magnet front and back ends. In 1991, most of the toys that I owned like Duplos carried over. However, my personality and tastes were starting to become more refined as I was now three years old. Those interests were Tonka trucks of all different assortments and Play-Doh. In 1992, again, I had most of the same toys. However, I was a little older now and I was hanging out a lot more at my grandparents' house with my older cousins. And they were introducing me to board games like Mousetrap and Candyland. I was mostly an outdoors kid, so I didn't really get an assortment of toys because I didn't really play inside very often. I usually like playing with my cousins in the backyard of my grandparents' house. However, we always found time to play board games inside of a makeshift tent or anything that we could do outside in the backyard. 1993 is where things got a lot more interesting. Japanese TV series were starting to be introduced as brand new intellectual properties, but still using a lot of the Japanese TV footage. The big example of that was none other than the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Fox Kids was the reason why we got those shows as kids. That and Haim Saban. And like a moth to a flame, from the very first episode of me watching those transforming superhero teenagers with attitude, I was hooked. And Fox Kids wrangled my child heart and my parents' wallets and made sure that I bought all of the Power Ranger toys. <laughs> but 1993 was also a pretty insane year for toys besides the Power Rangers craze. I remember getting for Christmas the Magna Doodle, which was the Etch and Sketch's main competition. Pretty crazy to think about that it had no competition until then. And I also got that electronic hotshot basketball toy. Through 1993 to 1994, my parents and I were pretty active members of swap meets. It was one of the best ways for me to get toys and meet kids without my parents having to pay such high prices for new ones. The toys, not the kids. And it was a fun activity to barter with the other kids to get their toys. 1994 was a big year for me as it marked the year that I officially joined a community that I am proud to say that I am still an active member of today. 1994 marked my entrance into the gamer community. And to christen that beautiful moment in life was my brand new from Sears Super Nintendo Entertainment System bundled with Super Mario World. Ah, now that is a good gift.
1994 was a huge year for me. As I said, it was one of the biggest moments in my life getting a Super Nintendo. And my dad inadvertently started what would become another life obsession. Fighting games, and later on, the fighting game community. My dad got me my very first fighting game on the Super Nintendo, and that was Street Fighter II The World Warrior. And besides Super Mario World, there was no other game that I played the most and put the most hours into. For me, Street Fighter II was like the gift it kept on giving. There was always something new to discover. And we didn't have the internet back then, so it wasn't like we could figure out how to throw a fireball by just looking online. It was all about experimentation, hours upon hours of being in the lab, as we say, or being lucky enough to come into some magazines that just so happened to have some fighting game advice. But in the mid 90s, gaming magazines actually weren't that popular or that widely accessible at the time. They really wouldn't catch their stride until the late 90s and early 2000s. But I digress. 1994 can be summed up as the year of Street Fighter for me. There are no other games out there, besides Pokemon at least, that bring me a level of excitement that I get like a child than playing a fighting game, and even more so with a brand new Street Fighter game. In 1995, collecting toys was slowly becoming a distant memory as I started to collect games more than toys. And during the holidays when we would travel to my grandparents' house, either by road trip or flying, it was increasingly difficult to be able to play my Super Nintendo, as you couldn't bring a Super Nintendo on the airplane, nor was there a setup where you could play it in your car. So my mother made a deal with me. She would buy me a Game Boy if I played a game or two that required reading. And you know that cringy shirt that you sometimes see that is supposed to be marketed towards gamers where it says, quote, everything that I've learned in life, I learned from playing video games, unquote. Well, actually, that statement isn't too far from the truth for me, because Final Fantasy Legends and its subsequent sequels would become one of the game series that taught me how to read. And to this day, Final Fantasy Legends remains one of my all-time favorite series to play. However, even though my life was now on a brand new trajectory of video games, there wasn't always the need to buy a brand new video game when we had places that you could rent games, like Blockbuster. And most of the time during those days, since we didn't have the internet, we didn't know if games were even going to be that good when they came out. So renting them at Blockbuster was crucial to my parents having the ability to save money so that they could buy me the toys that I wanted. And I'm proud to say that I was a Toys R Us kid. And if there was a Toys R Us where we were nearby, you can guarantee that I was in there looking at the brand new Power Ranger toys or whatever else was new and shiny at the time. And let's just say there was a brand new Green Ranger toy, like the Dragon Dagger Flute or the Dragon Zord sitting there taunting me inside that Toys R Us, you can guarantee that I, Richie Maestro, begged my mom to get it for me with all of my heart and soul, but then she just ended up saying no anyway. So, <sighs> yeah. 1995 up until 1996 was a year full of video games for me, but there was also quite a bit of big toy releases too. Power Rangers was coming into its second season, and we were starting to see Tommy the Green Ranger become Tommy the White Ranger. And not to mention that a Mighty Morphin Power Rangers live show. And even though the live show is not technically a toy or a game, it's still a merchandise per se, and it was so unique that it should be mentioned here. Not to mention that the price to go to this concert was essentially just as expensive as a Power Ranger toy or even the Super Nintendo game. And speaking of the game, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the movie, the game was one of my all time favorite games to play back in 1995. And who could forget the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the fighting edition, which was a fighting type game with Zords. If you were a fan of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers during this time, you had no shortage of any kind of merchandise or entertainment, that's for sure. And even if you weren't a fan of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, you were a fan of Disney because 1995 brought the very first Pixar movie, Toy Story. And oh, was there merchandise for that. 
1995 and even up to 1996, my family and I would constantly frequent McDonald's because the toys that you would get from McDonald's during that time was pretty top tier, not gonna lie. Especially around the Power Rangers movie that came out and also Toy Story. And then there was always the really good Hot Wheels cars. Couldn't go wrong with a Happy Meal in the mid 90s, that's for sure. McDonald's during the 90s was the goaded era. On Sundays, you could get a cheeseburger for 29 cents. And on Wednesdays, you could get a hamburger for 39 cents. We would be going home with bags of cheeseburgers. So many cheeseburgers. And I always remembered being happy with the toys that I got. And the McDonald's employees were always really chill to us as kids. They would always exchange the toys if we didn't want them, even sometimes if they were already open. But most of the time they didn't need to because the bags were see-through and you could kind of see already what kind of toy you were gonna get before you got it and you were just like, I don't want this one. And then they'd just be like, cool, we'll take it from you. Here you go. Thanks, older guy. I wanna be just like you when I grow up. Ah, uh, to be a naive child. I remember that I was pretty adamant at getting the White Ranger Falcon Zord toy for the Mighty Morphin Power Ranger, the movie Happy Meal. I think it took me maybe two to three Happy Meals before I actually got it. Tommy was always the most popular. So in the McDonald's that I went to, they were usually always out of him. But I finally did get him. 1996 was a game changer for sure, and no pun intended. 1996 introduced us to the Nintendo 64. Oh man, 64 bits of graphics. I still played my Super Nintendo. I had so much fun with that thing. But seeing Super Mario 64 commercial, man, did I want a Nintendo 64 so bad. But the Nintendo 64 didn't come out towards the end of the holidays. So we had to figure out something else to play with. Thankfully, Japan coming in to save us with entertainment and gave us egg-shaped little electronics with little virtual pets inside, the Tamagotchis. I don't know if I have a lot to say in the regards of the Tamagotchi. I felt that even though I was very young, I still felt that, that the Tamagotchi was rigged because my Tamagotchi never made it past eight years old or eight days old, I should say. And I even let my mom play it once after it died and huh? she said the exact same thing. It always would die on the eighth day. So we returned it to Toys R Us, never thought about it again. Instead, I got into something that was a lot more productive. I got into yo-yos. Okay. Dunkin' yo-yos were the craze way back in the days, I think in the 70s or 80s, the Dunkin' Butterfly yo-yos. And these yo-yos that we were using were either by a company called Yomega or they were pro-yos. I remember when I went to get my very first yo-yo. My mom took me to the local mall and we went into the big yo-yo store and they had wall upon wall of yo-yos. The most expensive yo-yo was called the Bumblebee yo-yo. It was like $120 at the time. My mom was not going to be spending $120 on something she didn't think I was going to be playing with. And my first yo-yo was a purple fireball one by Yomega. And I learned how to do all the tricks. I still can do them. Okay. I actually found a few years back a Bumblebee yo-yo, but get this, it was at Walgreens and it was not $120. It was eight. <laughs> so this, th so I had been using that one for practice in the most recent years. It's actually still in storage somewhere, but I digress. The yo-yo was huge. I mean, it was a phenomenon back when I was in school. This was around, ooh, third grade for me. Yeah, third grade. The other weird collection toy besides yo-yos, because yo-yos also became a collectible, were these things called Beanie Babies which were these little dolls that filled with spider eggs. <laughs> Just kidding, they're filled with beans or whatever. There was a funny rumor that went around that they were all filled with spider eggs and that they would hatch and it freaked out all kinds of mothers. <laughs> but my favorite Beanie Baby was a pug and I still have him to this day. His name is Pugsley, he sits on my desk. And once again, McDonald's would also have a version of their own Beanie Babies or at least a small release. And my favorite one from them was a little purple gecko. And I can't remember what her name is. I know it was a girl though. My dad always used to say Gleekos and it would be annoying to me, even though I was a kid and, and you know, you think your dad's annoying when he says things silly. 
Turns out, though, that uh, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree because now at any time that I see a gecko, I always call it a gleeko as well in his memory. It's funny how you do things in honor of your parents as you get older. The console game wars was amped up and hot during 1996. The Nintendo 64 had a lot of competition. Sega came out with its new console called the Sega Saturn, and another company came out with their own console, and that was the Sony PlayStation. But even though these consoles came out around the exact same time, I was still using my Super Nintendo. Street Fighter Alpha 2 came out on the Super Nintendo in 1996, so I was preoccupied playing that game. As a matter of fact, I still play that game. That's one of my all-time favorite Street Fighter games, besides Third Strike. And there was another fighting game that I picked up in 1996. Even though this game had come out onto the Super Nintendo console in 1994, I was kind of late to picking it up. And that game was Killer Instinct. Besides Street Fighter Alpha 2 and Street Fighter in general, I don't think there was another game at least in the fighting game genre, that I played as much as Killer Instinct on the Super Nintendo. And for really any other games, I was still a product of the arcade scene. I used to play a lot of games at the arcades when we go to like Chuck E. Cheese or Godfather's Pizza. Those places were the places that you got to meet up with friends, meet new friends. And even there was a stint of time that the McDonald's in my area used to have Super Nintendos to play. So there was your chance to beat some strangers in some Street Fighter if they had it on the system. And many of arguments that would be had when you're playing a kid and he accuses you of cheating and then he runs it back with you 10 times and he still loses and then the fight becomes a fist fight and the fight spills into the ball pit and you got an all out brawl. Not that I'm talking from an experience or anything like that. <laughs> But besides fighting games, right around this time, I was getting really into watching football with my dad. And this was the time that I became a really big fan of the Dallas Cowboys. So my dad got me the Madden games. So my first Madden game was Madden 95, first since down. it was the cheaper one to get at the time, even though it was 1996. And then I believe I got Madden 97 eventually. And if I remember correctly, the Madden series always used to have the year that was the following year. So Madden 97 was released in 1996 because it was supposed to be like future or something like that. I don't remember how it went. I just know Madden did it for a long time. If you know why Madden does that, let me know in the comments. In 1996 and 1997, Godzilla was getting really popular again. The Heisei era was really big and that was my favorite iteration of Godzilla was the Heisei era. Plus we were knee deep in the attitude era of the WWF or WWE. So as the Power Rangers, at least for me, started to lose its luster since I wasn't going to be seeing Tommy as often and the Power Ranger Turbo and the Power Ranger in space series, I wasn't really digging it. The cars were cool and turbo, but that was pr pretty much it. I was looking for other things to be interested in. I was still interested in football and Godzilla. So we were collecting Godzilla whenever we were at a swap meet or we found a classic collection one. But it wasn't really hard to find since like Target used to carry a lot of the Godzilla toys. Toys R Us actually, I don't remember them really having Godzilla toys, as a matter of fact. I know KB toys used to as well. I should also mention that besides Godzilla, I was really into the Batman the Animated Series. I grew up with that besides the Power Rangers. So there was kind of like a set time that I would be watching cartoons. And this was like a typical thing for millennials that grew up. We had like set times of watching certain shows. Like there would be, Power Rangers would be in the mornings and then you get home from school and then you'd have Batman the Animated Series, Bobby's World, you had Animaniacs. You had all kinds of crazy cartoons and shows that were really popular. And I'm gonna make another video talking about my favorite shows. But the reason why I bring up Batman the Animated Series is because of the fact that it was also one of the big collectible toys that I would get. I would get like the Joker toy or Batman. I used to like the Hot Wheels collection and I, I don't remember if I ever got the Hot Wheels Batmobile. I've been looking for it to this day and I have not been able to find the one from the 90s. I've seen the, the remake with Hot Wheels. They did like a redo 
and it looks cool. I was almost tempted to buy it recently, but I just couldn't pull the trigger. I've been really wanting that 90s one because it's something that I never got to have as a kid. I don't know if you guys ever feel like that. You ever get feeling about something like a toy or something that you see now and you now have access to adult money. So now you're just buying it. Somebody said on TikTok, it was like due to the fact that we all had PTSD growing up from not being able to afford anything as kids. And so now that we have adult money, we go and basically are getting into buying the things that we never were able to before. And I'm off on a tangent here, but I don't remember, to be honest with you, 1997 being that memorable of a toy year and i can't remember anything that i really got that stuck out because the following year 1998 is where everything changed 1998 brought the biggest craze of all time pokemon or in japan it was still called pocket monsters depending on when you're watching this video you may have not known that Pokemon was called Pocket Monsters, unless you, you know, looked at Wikipedia or something. So, hello future people. Anyways, if you did not already have a Game Boy, which I did, but carry around the original Game Boy, especially going to school and stuff like that, it was, that thing was, was chunky, man. That was like a big, fat, chunky boy. And I wanted something that was a little more up to date, a little more smaller to have. And my mom agreed. So she bought me my very first Game Boy Color, the purple one. I think there was three colors. There's like a purple, a silver one, and a pink one, I think, if I remember. But I got the purple one and I loved it. I still have it to this day. It's in a box in storage somewhere, but I have it still. I have Pokemon Crystal sitting in it right now. But that's a story for another time. I got Pokemon Red version. In Pokemon Red version, I started the game the first time played through. I didn't have a strategy guide. I didn't have anything. Didn't see any magazines at the time to come out I didn't prepare myself like we had in the future I chose Charmander because he was pretty cool looking he looked like a fucking dragon and then I got into playing and because when you play in Pokemon red and blue your rival blue Gary whatever the heck you call him douchebag whatever <laughs> whatever you would call him he had always chose the the guy that was weaker to you or stronger to you so he chose squirtle and i was like okay cool whatever squirtle and when i got to the point in the game that i saw what squirtle evolved into i was so envious of my freaking make-believe in-game rival i was like oh my god that is so cool blastoise what the heck is th what i restarted my game and i chose squirtle he chose bulbasaur from that point on, I never really looked at getting Char Charmander. I used to use Charizard like in Ruby and Sapphire back when I was still doing competitive gaming just because he was useful for belly drumming purposes. And I and I had a team and I thought it was pretty fun, but that was kind of niche. From that point on, pretty much every Pokemon game that I've had the pleasure of playing, I have always chosen Squirtle uh, or the water type. And I've always somehow tried to get my Blastoise in there. I don't have the original Blastoise anymore. I ran into the issue that a lot of people have with the old cartridges was that the those cartridges had like these little bitty uh batteries with the time with like for the internal clock and they would die out and all your data would get erased so my i don't have any of the original pokemon that i have from red version however i also got pokemon yellow but i digress once i chose squirtle i was set for life and why i say that is because it also revolved around my choices for what came out also during 1998 which was the card game the pokemon trading card game i was one of the very first people in my area to put together a blastoise rain dance deck I got it based upon, I think it was a Pojo magazine. If you guys remember Pojo magazine, hit me a like and tell me in the comments what, if you remember Pojo comics, even the Pojo website, P-O-J-O. -O. Let me know if you remember that. I start, there was somebody that was a guy that was in a completely different state. He was an adult playing, uh, playing the Pokemon trading card game. And he was building a rain dance Blastoise deck. And the strategy was so cool to me, being able to like buff your Blastoise with all kinds of water energy and just keep putting it on and laying it on and laying it on until he was just an unstoppable monster and i just loved that idea and i built the first version of that before fossil came out 
But it wasn't just the trading cards and the video game. It was everything. Pokemon was such a huge craze. There was so much merchandise. McDonald's had merchandise. Almost every place had to get some kind of Pokemon. And there was a lot, a lot of bootleg Pokemon toys. If you ever got a bootleg Pokemon toy, let me know in the comments, because I want to know which one you got. But if you saw the thumbnail, you will already know the toy that I'm about to talk about right now. And that is the Pokemon Pikachu, or otherwise known as the Pocket Pikachu in Japan. I don't know why we didn't call it the Pocket Pikachu in America. It just makes more sense to call it Pocket Pikachu. We already knew what the Pikachu was, and it was from Pokemon. We didn't have to call it the Pokemon Pikachu. It was kind of like a grandma saying, Why are you getting a Pikachu? Gotta get your Pikachu? 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 Richie, you gonna get Pikachu? I'm making fun of my grandma, because that's what she used to say. And I love my grandma. But she washed a pair of my pants that had one of my rare Dark Gyarados promo card in it and ruined it. So as much as I love my grandma, and if grandma you're listening up in heaven, I love you. Washed my Gyarados. <laughs> my Gyarados. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding about the fact that she washed I was devastated when she washed my cards. I want to know what you guys got. Uh, if you have any horror experiences with, with your Pokemon cards. <laughs> getting them, leaving them in your, in your pockets as kids and getting your parents washing them. But yeah, the Pocket Pikachu. Oh my gosh. We've had these conversations about exposing children to gambling mechanics and companies come out and they say and they pretend that they're all for it and stuff like that. Now And nowadays it's a serious topic, but back then we had a freaking slot machine on this thing. That was the main game on the Pocket Pikachu. And we all had this toy, okay? Everybody in my class had this toy, boys and girls. And I remember in school, the public schools were having a terrible time trying to keep up with the Pokemon craze. Like, you guys remember how big Pokemon Go came out in 2016 and how crazy that was? Imagine being a teacher in 1998 and 1999 when all of these things are coming out and kids are talking about Pikachu, this, Blastoise, Charmander, Mewtwo, whatever, and Mew. Mew is under the truck, and I know he's under the truck because my uncle worked at Nintendo. Actually, you know what, you guys? My cousin, no cap, worked at Nintendo, but he didn't tell me anything about Pokemon. He, he, he had his own life and didn't ever tell me anything about Pokemon. Yeah. But anyways, I can say that unironically. But actually for reals though, you guys, the Mew is actually under the truck. What you have to do is you have to go and get strength, but you have in order to get strength, you have to use the magic shovel that's located in the basement of your house. And then you have to go around your house 300 times counterclockwise in order for the secret hatch under your house. <laughs> And then you can use the magic shovel to dig underneath the truck and there will be a pokeball with Mew inside of it. All for you. <laughs> so when, anyways. <laughs> Anyways, when we when we brought Pokemon uh, uh, Pocket Pikachu to school, our teachers did not know what was going on because these things also had like a little pedometer in it. Every time you would walk, it would shake and it would build up steps. And those are the steps that would turn into coins and then you can use it for gambling. When you're sitting in class for five to six hours a day, you'd only get recess like twice. Obviously you get those steps in, but you wanna have more coins. So we were all thinking of ways to keep the Pocket Pikachu without being distracting to the teacher because she said she would always take it away as she saw him. And some of us like me got really creative. I used to duct tape mine to my shoe and then I would tap my foot in class and that was how I got my steps. You probably could hear it shaking, but like she never saw my hands on it. So like she couldn't really say if I was using it or not. I was just tapping my foot. And that's how I did that. By the way, that slot machine was rigged. Oh, and learning about missing no, that was a fun time too. Did you learn about missing no through school or did you learn it from like siblings? Let me know in the comments. I learned it from a kid in school. His name was Matthew. He said, can I see your Game Boy? And I was like, sure. I watched over his shoulder as he did it and went to the guy to, for the learning how to do the Pokeball and then flew to Cinnabar Island and half on land and half on water, up and down, up and down. And missing no duplicated my Master Balls. That was the best ever. 
No more having to struggle throwing Pokeballs and never being able to catch things. Nowadays, it's pretty easy to catch Pokemon. You don't even have to use Master Ball anymore. It's more of a more of a paperweight now. I, I don't think I've ever used a Pokeball since 2002. But the other big thing that happened in 1998 at the peak of Pokemon's popularity was the Pokemon the first movie. And there was merchandise for that too. We all got that promo Pikachu card and we all wanted the promo Mewtwo card. I think only a few of us got that. And then you got the ancient Mew card. If anybody still remembers the ancient Mew card and you still have it and you didn't try to sell it because it's worthless. <laughs> Let me know in the comments. But another toy that I got during the craze of Pokemon was the this Pikachu that would talk and its cheeks would flash when it was on your palm. It had these two little metal discs on the bottom of it. And when you place it on your hand, I guess it was heat conducting or something about it when your hand touched the two points. I'm not sure how that worked. If you know, let me know. But I had that, you know, Pikachu, Pikachu, you know, went in your hand. Very cute, loved it. But throughout 1998, we were getting commercials and being teased for a big game release, a super game release of the Smash variety, brother. Get it? It was, it, it was it's Super Smash Brothers. We were getting commercials for the Super Smash Brothers where they were all like in the, uh, in the giant cosplays and they would... And then they would just beat each other up. And we were seeing something we had never seen before in a fighting game. And it just blew our minds and that was coming in 1999 and without further ado that brings us to the final year of this video 1999 and if you've been listening for this long and have made it this far give yourself a pat on the back or pat on the butt whatever you feel like you know patting at the time right now uh but thank you guys so much for listening so far feeling very parasocial with me right now i bet <laughs> Let me know in the comments what your favorite year in the 90s was. I'm really curious to know. 1999 was a huge year. Still coming off of the heat of the Pokemon, the first movie. Still in it with the Pokemon trading card game going to the weekly tournaments. Man, was I invested hook, line, and sinker, like I imagine a lot of you, into Pokemon. And life was good. I do not, and I'm still a huge Pokemon fan. I do not regret anything from that time at all. The only thing that I probably slightly regret is the fact that I'd never really got the Nintendo 64 when it first came out. I was still playing my Super Nintendo. I had my Game Boy. I had my Super Game Boy, which was the cartridge that you could put in your Super Nintendo to play your Game Boy games. And Pokemon was on the Game Boy. I didn't really need the Nintendo 64. I wasn't interested. There was too much cool things happening with Pokemon, going through it and capturing the Pokemon and leveling up. There was a lot of stuff that you could do with Pokemon. Plus I was really into the trading card game. I wasn't doing a lot of Nintendo 64 gaming. Even though Goldeneye came out in like, 1997. I don't remember even getting GoldenEye until probably late 1999. Pokemon was not letting up on us because Pokemon Stadium was coming out. We had just had our little sprite graphic Pokemon and suddenly they're teasing us with 3D rendered graphics of our favorite Pokemon. Unfreaking believable. Only a year later from the release of Pokemon in America. Isn't that wild? So Pokemon, the trading card game became, and any kind of Pokemon memorabilia became my collection of choice and toy collection of choice for quite a bit of time. I don't remember collecting anything else besides that for, I think even spilling into the 2000s. I don't think I got anything, I got into anything. Maybe not until Yu-Gi-Oh! But that is another decade that we can talk about at another time. I've got some other ideas that we can talk about, some other genres we can discuss in the 90s if you guys want to talk about something specific and like the music that I used to listen to, my favorite music during the each decade maybe. So without further ado, I just want to come and say thank you guys. This probably is, I think this is the longest video I've ever done that is not a game playing video. This video was a real challenge for me. I had never done anything talking about anything like this to the extent that I have and just kind of giving people a glimpse of my life growing up. But I'm hoping that by doing this, that the people you guys that have that have stuck around and are listening to this you also had moments like i did growing up and that we can share that with each other 
I think that would be really cool. I'm hoping that maybe I can bridge that gap and bring people that have shared similar life experiences and bring them in and you guys can come and talk to me. I'd love to talk to you. It'd be fun to just kind of hang out when I do lives and we can talk about that kind of stuff when we get the chance to maybe, who knows? But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It was a real fun, uh, really long video, man. I, my Right now my thing is telling me that I've been talking for 63 minutes. So uh, it's probably not gonna be that long because I'm gonna be editing it a lot, taking out a bunch of crap that doesn't need to be in here. But I appreciate you guys sticking around and leave a comment. Tell me anything that you remember from your childhood that you want to share, that you're willing to share with us. Because I guarantee somebody out there, or even me, is going to have shared a similar experience as you. And we want to hear it because we want to talk about it. <laughs> because we got nobody else to talk about it with. Have fun. Take care of yourself, everyone. And I'll see you in the next video. Love you.